Hey, what's going on guys? Kalamazi here. Patch 10.1 is officially, finally on PTR. And today with it came a handful, a slew of blue posts looking at gearing, buffs and nerfs of certain abilities, new rare trinkets in the raid, class tuning, new class weapons, dungeon tuning, and the official reveal of, I guess in game, of Zeralek Caverns, the new underground zone in 10.1. So tonight's video, we're looking at all of that, summarizing mostly, I guess, most of the larger PvE changes that came. Uh, I will mention now there is a PvE slash PvP kick, uh, expel lockout decrease that happened universally across the board. Um, it's PvP and PvE based. Uh, most people aren't a big fan of it. Uh, Blizzard did say they're going to adjust PvE based spells in S2 to reflect that change. We'll see where that goes. I'm not going to hit on it in the video in its own section. There's a lot to talk about tonight, but with that being said, let's just jump right into it looking at the Zerolek Caverns because out of all the zones in Dragonflight, they're all cool and unique, but this zone's massive. I was worried that it would maybe have a bit of like a Maw-esque kind of feel to it as well. I think somebody mentioned it on Twitter earlier today, and I agree with that, with it being a cave, like closed-in zone, but it doesn't at all. It is actually insane. So with that being said, let's get right into it. So if you want to get to Zerolek Caverns, the new zone in 10.1, it's very simple to get to from Valdragon. There's no introductory quest line, at least currently now, that might change, but all you do, open the map in Valdraken, zoom out to Thaldrassus, and there is a cave right here. All you do, simply fly off the edge, give your bird a little bit of juice, get down there a little bit faster, and there is this large gaping crevice, cave, I don't know, uh, ba <laughs> in the middle of the zone that somehow we missed up until now. I know there's a storyline behind it, some lore, but it's actually really cool. Now, one of the things Blizzard mentioned is that there's some unique new like layered phasing when it comes to uh, this new zone with Zerolik Caverns, where you fly through it for about half a minute here. It's sort of similar to Caverns of Time lengthwise, where the phasing from up top should not change whenever you get down low. You should still indeed be on the same shard it's this new unique technology they have. They mentioned in a blue post somewhere. It's very cool. Now, this part of the zone, that ominous cave just sound when you enter is so immersive. It's really cool. And this is the most constricted claustrophobic part of the zone, I'd say. This is more of like the Zangar Marsh slash Deep Home-esque part of the zone. If you head more up north, you have the magma, molten lava, aberrant raid entrance here. The cool thing is that in the middle of the zone, there's literally like a hybrid of both, like this yellow, just acidic sulfur waste rock kind of area the zone's massive dragon riding makes it makes it seem a little bit smaller than it is but i'm zooming across this map and it's not even moving very quickly there's a lot of road quests to do whether you head over into the molten lava side in the west coast more on the east side over here being in deep home there's i mean 15 road quests up right now they currently don't have rewards active which i assume is coming in a later ptr build but this zone is actually incredible and even though there's a lot to do on it in PTR right now, day one, I spent six and a half, seven hours in it, just zooming around, killing rares, doing rogue quests, all of that. If you want to get to the raid entrance and go look at what that looks like in the northern part, Avarice is here, right over the edge here. This is basically this entrance of the raid over the hill. There's this blue and red sort of contrasting, I guess, experimental vials, whatever this is. And you're basically at the front of the raid here. The zone's sick. I'll probably be exploring it a lot more on stream over the next few days, but it's very, very cool, really immersive, and I'm sure there's a million things I haven't even discovered in the first place, like snail racing. If you'd like a link to a map of Zerolet Caverns for whatever reason, I'll have a link down below to the Wildhead article that has that. Uh, like I said, the zone's sick. It's super immersive, and just when they implement more content in it, I'm sure in later PTRs, it's going to be actually just insane. So uh, moving on to that, so there were two interesting changes today one can be seen in my character panel here which we'll get to in a minute the first one though so elemental lariat I, I can sort of hover over it here as well is being nerfed or i guess changed in patch 10.1 now it's not really a nerf when it comes to this end game gearing most likely but so going more in depth here Ele elemental lariat's duration has been changed to five seconds was 12 seconds however they've made it like the jewel crafting trinket in a sense where it gets a bonus from having more gems it's increased by one second per elemental gem so off the bat elemental gems are these they are these haste mastery ones th these things it is not this fierce limited diamond so if you're using one of these this does not count towards the extra second. Now they put a note here talking about it a bit saying, uh, Larry, it's been one of the strongest embellishments basically due to the large bonus it grants whenever it procs. Uh, and Blizzard has clarified that this 
lariats, MS the blue, all this gear in season one can indeed be upgraded or I guess recrafted at a higher level in season two. We knew that we wanted to bring its power level back up back on the season boundary, but it was important to us that players' investment, meaning making lariats or whatever, and acquiring the item or the recipe was respected. The recipe is very expensive now too. Rather than reduce its power directly, we opted to redesign the passive to bring it in line with all the other jewel crafting effects by scaling an axis of power with the quantity of gems slotted. So what this means is essentially, so let's say patch 10.1 comes out, you have full gems. So you have three gems in your neck. Uh, you're going to have a, you're going to have one of these gems somewhere. So you have one gem in your helm, three here. So that's four, a gem in your bracers being five, a gem in your belt being six, and you have seven and eight, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, I can count eight. So there you go. Uh, now take away one because you have, once again, the fierce and limited diamond or whatever you're using. That's seven, five plus seven, that's 12. So realistically, when the patch comes out, as long as you have full gems, you will still have a fully empowered Lariat. Now, when you acquire new gear in patch 10.1 and you replace socket gear potentially, you will lose one second off the Lariat if you you know, don't replace that socket on a new piece of gear. So it's gonna go from being sort of er this early on in the patch using old gear to likely not being as good to being long-term later on in the patch when we're in farm in 10.1 and have full sockets again to most likely being BIS, if not very close to BIS, which is an interesting conundrum to be in, but I think it is indeed better than just nerfing it a crazy amount and making it irrelevant. Uh, it does follow suit with the jewel crafting trinket, so we'll see where it goes. It probably is the best middle ground solution to Lariat being as strong as it is. Now, the second thing here is you might have noticed my Lariat is 421. My crafted rings are also 421. 418 is the current eye level cap on retail for all crafting gear. It can't go past that. So we're not sure if it's a bug or if it's intended, but on PTR, 418 crafted gear is indeed now 421 baseline. This might be a bug. It might be intended. We're not really sure. So I'm hoping Blizzard clarifies in an upcoming PTR build. Realistically, I'm buying sockets either way at this point to put in my uh, unsocketed belt and my unsocketed whatever, what have you, right? But one of the big things, one of the big issues with 10.0 is that when it comes to raiding and Mythic Plus, 415 is the highest cloak you can get from the raid. 415 is the highest pair of bracers you can get from the raid if you're, if you're a clothy. 415 is also the highest pair of legs you can get from the raid unless you craft legs, but then they can't be tier legs. So this might be an intended change or solution to having 418 lesser eye level gear heading into the patch or maybe trying to alleviate that issue there. Not really sure. But if it is indeed the case and they clarify on that, it does relieve a lot of stress of filling you know, all these BIS 421 slots that you can only get from the plus from the Great Vault. So we'll see where that goes, but it's important to point out, Lariat is changing, going from being BIS, probably a mediocre to being BIS at the end of the patch again. And it's quite possible if you're farming plus for all these max 421 slots that you can't get in the raid, you might not have to do that depending if this is indeed a bug or intended. Now up next, we have the return of very rare items in Aberus, which has caused a lot of, sparked a lot of debate. Uh, there's been a lot of mixed takes today on very rare items. Listen, I will say that I've gotten pretty lucky when it comes to them. Uh, I have all of the very rare items from the raid at Mythic Eye Level, but there are people in my raid who are still chasing a Whispering Incarnate icon. We have seen one of these drop, which happened last night in raid. This is from my Great Vault. And we've seen, I think, three of these rings total. Now, there are indeed six new rare items in the raid currently, and they are actually pretty unique, at least half of them are. They are very rare clash trinkets. They all indeed drop from this boss here. I forgot what it is. Let me pull it up briefly. It is Neltharion. I should know that. Uh, they are Idol of Chaotic Arrogance, Idol of Debilitating Arrogance, and Idol of Domineering Arrogance. Now, uh, Warrior, Paladin, Mage, Demon Hunter, Evoker, you have Rogue, Priest, Death Knight, Druid here, and you have Hunter, Shaman, Warlock, and Monk. Now, this one says you get 3,500 Intellect when you cast Area Effect Spells. I'm assuming AoE spells, which is sort of odd, because if it's in a single target setting, it might not be the easiest to proc, depending on what class you're playing. But at the same time, they probably thought it through a decent bit. Uh, we'll see where it goes. Not really sure how it's going to work for a mage compared to a demon hunter or an evoker. Uh, keep in mind, this grants 3,500 intellect currently with baseline crit. This one here for rogue, priest, death knight, druid grants baseline versatility. Also, 
3,500 intellect. It'll be strength or agility based on your class, but they all have negative effects too. During the time the effect is active, you bleed for 62,000 nature damage over 12 seconds. This one here makes you take 5% more damage while the effect is active. Now the Warlock one is 5,700 intellect for the same duration, but during this time you're slowed by 10%. So just turn on Burning Rush and you're probably more than fine. I think out of all three of these, the slowest, the, like the best one, meaning it's the least uh, disruptive, Taking 5% more damage at certain points in a fight can mean death if it's a high-end prog setting on Razageth, for example. I've been very low on health, but not one to commit a health or health pot because I know I'm safe at a certain point. But if this effect procs at that point in time, there's a chance you might die. To a similar extent, if this procs at a poor time, you might die as well, depending on what's going on. This is relatively controllable, but there's a large main stat difference here, being 5,700 versus 37 or 35 and 35. Now, this one does say your summons attacks. Now, for hunters and warlocks, I checked this. It says your summons attacks have a chance to grant you intellect. If you swap to a monk, or your Zuen, Zuen, whatever it is, it says your sum. It's like your main pet or whatever. I, I checked it on my shaman. It's basically Zuen procs this. It's not a chance. It's a guaranteed uh, bonus intellect, strength, stamina buff whenever you summon Zuen, which is, I believe, a two-minute cooldown. And on Shamans, it says whenever you summon your main elementals, which is a minute and a half, I believe, roughly. I've heard Enhance can get it a lot lower than a minute and a half, but it's also guaranteed for a Shaman from what I've seen as well. Now, Hunter and Warlock's a bit different. There's a chance for it to proc, and we're not sure if this is, like, these pets here, like your Felguards and Imps and fell Hunters and stuff, or if it's, like, your Infernal and your Tyrant and your Dark Lair. I'm assuming it's your pets like this because it's a chance to proc comparatively to being guaranteed for monks and shaman having their baseline two minute cooldowns. Because if you gave your dark lair a two minute cooldown or your tyrant a one minute cooldown or your infernal a three minute cooldown, a, ch a chance to proc, it seems sort of subpar. Now they are indeed all very rare trinkets in the first place and they are also class specific. So chances of seeing one of these is exceptionally low barring a great vault, but that's that. There are also three other items in the raid. Seething, Black Dragon Scale from the first boss here. This is going to be a throwback to the Smoldering Black Dragon Scale, I believe, from Battle for Azeroth. It's from Wrath, the Unhumming Black Dragon Scale. On use effect, the equip, uh, you had wings, all that stuff. I'm assuming this trinket, as long as they sort of followed suit with like it being a throwback, probably gives you wings of some sort if it procs. Int, Agi Strength, it gives you baseline, or gives you a crit proc with a bit of leech, and you can use it to slam down on the ground and do some Shadow Flame damage. Sort of cool on a three minute cooldown. You also have a placeholder Agi Staff from the fifth boss here, which is really cool looking, but there's no effect on it yet. It looks pretty sick. And you also have another very rare item from the final boss being Scale Commander Sarkoleth, which is actually called Voice of the Silent Star. It is a cloak which has no effect on it yet. And for those that are wondering, all the eye levels are indeed the same across the array right now. 441, or, uh, 441 here, this is just here, 441, and 441 from this boss as well. I would assume they do indeed implement higher levels for higher bosses, but at this point, they are currently not in. Now, on top of that, you have some interesting changes, I guess, mechanics on the Neltharian fight. So they mentioned early on in reference to Blackwing Lair and Blackwing Descent, they wanted to sort of capture the essence of those raids. There's a mechanic on Neltharian that just like how on Nefarian, I believe, so many Nefarian names, all this stuff, changes based on your current class, whatever you're playing, if I can find the ability here, it's called Corruption. And it has an ability for every single class. Wild Bladestorm, Zealous Hammers, Corrupted Beast, Wild Treachery, Desperate Scream. For example, if you're a priest and you get, you get mind controlled, your corruption causes the priest's faith to falter, forcing them to erupt in a desperate scream every six seconds for half a minute, dealing shadow damage and fearing players. Wild Grip is the Death Knight ability that causes you to death grip people to your location. Shaman drop a totem and summons a pet yet to kill. Warlocks summon a uh, ravenous void beast that runs around. Probably can banish it, but it, you have to kill it at some point. Um, monks do uh, flying spirit kick things and summons these earth, wind, fire adds, whatever they are. Druids sort of got the uh, short end of the stick. They don't do damage to the raid. They just have problems. <laughs> now, Therian takes advantage of the Druid's connection to nature, 
forcing them to shapeshift to a random form every six seconds. So on the positive end of things, there's no ray damage to worry about. But if you're a druid, that's probably going to suck, depending on what spec you're playing. Evokers have Wild Breath, which is a, like a cone, like flying deep breath race ability. Demon Hunters have Chaos Dance, I believe. Mages have just like a pulsing AOE effect here as well. And we also have Brogues having some kind of Shadow Stuff ability. Corrupted Beast is a pet hunter summon. Zealous Hammers are Hammers Paladin store down that does a lot of damage if you're near them. And Wild Blade Storm is a Wild Blade Storm. So pretty cool if you like the Nefarian fight. Uh, references back to that. Pretty cool. And I reviewed all the bosses on stream. We'll go over it again at some point here. I'll probably on YouTube as well. But the fights in this raid are really, really cool from what it looks like, from just the base on ability breakdown. But Notharian looks to be actually insane. And RNG is RNG. At times you're gonna get multiple, just bad overlaps. Like imagine getting double priest corruption with a DK. <laughs> Let's just grip the raid in and psychic scream everybody away. Now Mythic Plus is not currently part of 10.1 PTR. I'm assuming it's going to come out relatively soon. However, for those that have forgotten, now Theris, Oldemon, Brackenhide Hollow, and Halls of Infusion are the four Dragonflight dungeons that are part of S2. Now Therian's Lair, Freehold, Underrot, and Vortex Pinnacle are the four returning dungeons. They're tuning a little bit in Vortex Pinnacle. I will say, I do not remember this dungeon at all. I don't know what these things are. I'll look at it when it comes on PTR. A few changes here and there. Now, they are seeing minor nerfs and buffs in certain spots, nerfing Dragon Strike a bit from Chargath. They ended up actually buffing Blazing Charge on Magma Tusk, but nerfing both the initial damage and dot effect on Magma Eruption, which is interesting. When it comes to Underrot, though, this is where things get a bit funny. So those early packs that cast Blood Bolts and cast Dark Recons and Gifts of Gahoon, they've all been nerfed. Blood Bolt got a minor nerf. Dark Recon, the cast time was changed from two and a half seconds to three and a half seconds. And Gifted of Gahoon no longer has the 100% damage increase on the mob for 25 seconds. It's now just basically the target can't die for 20 seconds until you remove the actual effect or I guess 20 seconds passes. They've also nerfed hook snare, uh, Hooked Snare a bit and all that. A few nerfs coming in here to Upheaval from Swarcaller Zancha. They've nerfed Indigestion from Krogmaw as well as Tantrum. Shockwave, Upheaval being nerfed on Swarcaller. And uh, yeah, targeting some of the harder hitting abilities in Underrot. Moving on to Notharian's Slayer, the Nashers. These are the Crocs. The Crocs that everybody would pull after the second boss <laughs> for count. They've buffed them considerably. Bone Chop received roughly a 65-ish percent buff, I believe, from 34 to 88 thousand physical damage a few other things here and there being changed crush uh bound being nerfed a bit here crystal spike being increased a little bit from the actual bio, bio shard chunks and things ember swipe being buffed here there's one other effect oh stone bolt got hit pretty hard essentially it is a 50 percent nerf more buffs to nashers here the stone gaze was changed from none to magic um it looks like they're targeting some of the harder hitting mobs in here as well. We'll see what happens with Pelters down the line and things. But uh, now Therian Slayer is known as being one of the harder hitting dungeons, I feel like, even when it comes to time walking. And there's no more kiting strategies like you had back in Legion when you had an Aflock to slow everything and just run and have things die along the way. So we'll see where this goes. A minor buff to Falling Debris on Crag Shaper, second boss in the actual dungeon. Strike of the Mountain receiving a pretty big nerf, about 45, no, 55%, I believe, roughly. And Sunder being nerfed a bit as well. Halls of Infusion, receiving some tuning as well. Uh, some nerfs mostly across the board to the frogs, some cave-in abilities. I don't know where all these are, be being honest with you. I haven't run this place in six months, but we'll see where it goes. Uh, whenever it comes up on PTR, we'll obviously run it. Nerfing Frost Shock on Kajin, which I believe is the second to last boss, and Tsunami is the final boss. Nerfing Tsunami, Tempest Fury, and nerfing Waterlogged here as well. Moving on to Oldemon, also some tuning coming in. End up buffing the Chain Lightning on Bromok, also buffing Stone Spike here. Sentinel Talandris being nerfed a bit. I believe this is the Shielding boss as well, seeing a nerf to both Crushing Stomp and Earthen Spikes. Emberon getting a bit of a nerf to his Searing Clap damage. Chronolord getting a bit of a buff to Time Sink. Brackenhide Hollow getting substantial nerfs to a handful of abilities, cutting the damage of Gash Frenzy in half. Uh... I don't know what this even is. Uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. And the last one here being Freehold. For those that remember Freehold and the final few packs before the boss, Painful Motivation has been nerfed. It now inflicts 1% maximum health as damage every one second and not 3%. So 
If you're planning on making those very large pulls and killing mobs with painful motivation, that might be changing. But it's good to see Blizzard tuning things already. Hopefully, Mythic Plus hits PTR in the next few weeks. During beta, they would open up Mythic Plus for testing on the weekend once raid testing had concluded. So hopefully that's the case here as well. We will see. But uh, believe me, we're jumping into a freehold the moment it goes live. Now, the final thing here, which is actually very interesting, there was also a set of class specific weapons, shields and offhands data mined on PTR. We don't know where these come from but they're actually pretty unique. And it's not like the leveling greens we've gotten for transmog and raids and things. They're actually like, they're pretty, they, they look like they belong to a DK, to a warlock, to a paladin. I mean, they have the DK theme to them. People are speculating this could be some kind of new weapons being added to the mage tower. Warglaives, demon hunters can't go wrong. Druid's getting a pretty interesting knife skin as well as a fist weapon and a stave. Uh, fist weapon being here and here is the actual staff bit interesting mage is getting the same thing uh staff sword offhand saves offhands for monks paladin getting a mace two-handed mace one-handed mace and a shield which looks pretty cool uh preceding a staff one-handed mace and an offhand rogues getting knives same thing as always a curved knife for a rogue <laughs> every time shaman's getting pretty cool shields here uh warriors getting a sword and shield and warlocks getting a knife which actually looks pretty cool and a staff now once again we don't know where these come from I'm assuming it's some kind of challenge based setting. I don't know if Blizzard clarified about the Mage Tower being in game or not in 10.1 or getting an update, but we'll see where it goes. Hunter and Evoker currently aren't in, but that is likely to change. And uh, yeah, 10.1 shaping up to be, be a pretty cool patch. I really love the zone. We'll see how very rare items go. I would love a Dinar system, which would allow you to maybe target rare items at some point if you can't get them. Hopefully, Plus is tuned in a proper form when it goes live and we'll keep an eye on the 418 to 421 item level increases on crafted gear and all of that with that being said thanks for watching guys i will catch you all again soon on stream peace